Okay, perfect. What's up? Um, so for that final part where it's you're like you're doing the time step iteration, yeah, you set a plug in T. Yep. Which T did you mean? Did you mean the point zero five or the T equals one to plus two? So that T increments each time, right? And so it starts at zero, and yeah. then after the first time step, it'll be zero point zero five, and then after that, it'll be from zero point one. And so on and so forth. Point zero, point zero. I mean, it, it increases each time by zero point zero five. So, so your point zero five. So the first time it's point zero five. The next time will be zero point one. Zero one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you keep increasing that. I just put yeah. plugged in one uh -huh. and two because it was like t equals one t. Okay. I mean, you have you have kind of the right idea. It's just and instead of that, it's just uh, you plug in the the time step. Yeah. So the thing that uh, man, I should probably thought about it in, uh, as code because I would have probably been like. Yeah, the hint, the big hint, right? Right, because right. you do that in the code. You right. just multiply it by the time step size. Right, but exactly. I was thinking in terms of what's in front of me, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize you literally meant that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's where I got kind of lost. Like, uh, the time step size, or that literally plug into the one. Yeah, it seems like it seems like a lot of people. I think probably need to have more, or maybe I need to assign that one for the homework because I because I, that for a problem like that. We did an example for that in the class a couple of times. And then for the review, I did a problem like that too, but it wasn't in the homework. So I think probably for the future, I need to do a homework problem like that yeah. too. Yeah. How much are you going to take off for not getting the middle part right? Uh, so that part I intentionally put in less because just because we haven't really, you know, there's no example problem for that. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, it seems like you have the right idea. So, yeah. I mean, probably so that part was worth five points. And so, you know, if I can see that, if I can see that you're incrementing up, maybe I'll just take off two points or something like that. Right. Yeah, I try to be generous with the, with the partial credit for this class, just because theoretically it's it's a tough class to kind of wrap your head around. Yeah, well, there was a lot to remember for this mm -hmm. term. Right, the right. Off term. Yeah, and then we, I know. Did, we did stuff on top of that in addition. Right. We went with like that convection diffusion, so it was like I had a lot to kind of block out of my brain. Right. Yeah. But, okay. Thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, nice to us. <laughs> I always try. better uh, a little bit cold but okay that was fun mm -hmm.
Oh, no, I'm good. Thanks, so. sure? I'm sure. It's not a bribe, I promise. No, it's <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I just had, I had something to eat before. Um, Dr. Chong, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we use to do the matrix multiplication? How do you do the matrix multiplication? Yeah, because I messed up the algebra. Uh, are you talking just in general how to do matrix multiplication? Like the one in the exam. When yeah. We had the five by five. Yeah. And then plus that one back there. Yeah. So then you would just multiply like when you multiply. You, there's always a matrix that comes first and then the other one is usually a vector or a matrix. In that case, we had a vector, right? Mm -hmm. And so you would take the first row in the matrix and then that would multiply by the first, the, just the column of the vector. And so you basically do a dot product. You do a dot product between the first row and that vector. But for T equals zero? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It will just give us the system of regions that we put in, right? Yeah, so it's just a matrix multiplication. And so with your initial condition of zero, you have zero multiplied by that matrix. It's all zero. So it's zero, 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 zero. Oh, it's not zero for T? T is also zero. But then the initial conditions is also zero. Like you oh, assume all the phi. Yeah, all the phi. Phi one through five at N is going to be zero as well. Okay. And then like, do you do like, let's say uh, the row is like one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. and then the vectors, and then plus, I mean, that one vector of Bs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then plus that vector of Q. Exactly. Do we multiply the row by the vector? And yes. The last result, we add it by that one. The one, the same, the same row that's in that one. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. At the end, I do. For all your classes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it's uh, 7 p.m. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Doing okay? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Yeah, some 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 people in, in the class just took a midterm of mine, so <laughs> I think sitting in a lecture is definitely better than taking. So, you know, hopefully, your mood improves throughout the lecture today. Okay, all right. So we uh, so this week is an ANSYS week, and so we had we have an activity um, planned for Wednesday, um, and so just like tr in traditional fashion, you know, today is going to be like the prep lecture, and so we're going to go over like some of the theory and some of the concepts behind you know the the feature in ANSYS we're going to use on Wednesday. And then Wednesday, we're actually going to put it into practice. Okay. Uh, so this week's an interesting one. I, I know I say that every week, but I know I know uh, <laughs> I think everything's interesting in this class. Otherwise, I wouldn't teach it. Um, <laughs> uh, so this week is all about modal analysis and harmonic response. And so we're talking about a lot about vibrations today. We're going to talk about why that's important and uh, you know how we can actually set this up in answers. Okay. Um, so the activity itself uh, is it's fairly short. Um, it's definitely uh, much shorter than activity six for sure. Um, and same thing with activity eight. So we're doing activity eight next week. It's also a fairly short one just because I know at this at this time, you know, we're kind of getting down to crunch time in the in the semester. Um, so everyone's thinking about the project. And so 
you know, the next two activities are, are definitely on much more, much more on the lighter side, just so um, that you guys have extra time for the project. Dr. Chan, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, so we have two activities left, right? Yes. Um, activity seven is set for this Wednesday, correct? Correct. Yep. And then we're going to get activity eight one week after this Wednesday. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, okay. So having said that, I'm just trying to understand when the deadlines are. Are they going to be due exactly one week after or the yes. Friday after? Yeah. So there'll be, you'll have a week to do each activity. So um, for activity seven, that's going to be due next Wednesday. And then okay. the activity eight will be due the Wednesday after that. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, and then for the final week, so we do have one more week of lecture after activity eight. So we have we have basically three more weeks of lectures. So we have this week, next week, and the week after. So I don't have anything planned for the final week. And so usually what I'd like to do, um, you know, for classes like this where the final project is, you know, a, a really big portion of your grade, is I like to have this project workshop. And so you know, I'll dedicate the whole week. You know, I don't have any, I won't have any lectures planned, but if you want to bring your project to the class um, just so we can talk about it and you want to get feedback from me or help from me, you know, that's that's kind of what that last week is for. Um, Dr. Chan. Yes. So going off of what you said, in theory, next week would be our last week of lecture, but that last actual week is there um, in case we need help. We would drop exactly. in. Right, right. Yeah. So if you don't, if you don't need help on the, if you, if you, if you're feeling like you don't need help on the project, then, you know, you can take the last week off if, if you want. Um, but um, then we last can also week email you though, right? Wait a second. Um, we can also email you. Of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. You can always okay. email me. You can come to office hours, but uh, that last week will be kind of like extended office hours during the Very lunch. nice. Thank last you, sir. Week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the plan. So, you know, we, we, we are very quickly winding down the semester. So, you know, I want to kind of uh, communicate that to you guys. Um, are there any other questions about kind of the schedule for the rest of the semester or just anything we're doing this week or next week? Yeah. Uh, I'll have to check. So I, I think last time I taught this class, I made the last assignment optional, but it, it's very short. And so it's uh, it, it won't take you that long to do it at all. Um, wait a second. We get extra one. Um, I'll see. I need to look at activity eight again, and then you know, I'll, I'll get back to it. Yeah. yeah. I want to do activity eight, though, because, you know, the, the final project, you know, part of the final project is you have to incorporate um, some features that we went over. So activity eight is probably the easiest one that you can incorporate into your final project. <laughs> so it's good. It's, it's, it's good to, it's good to do that one. Can they be due together? Um, which one? So, so activity eight will be due um, the week before finals, and then the final project is due a week and a half after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions on anything before we start today? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the lecture today. So the subject for today's lecture is modal analysis and harmonic response. Dr. Chan, I just wanted, one, wanted to say thank you for being so orderly with this class. Uh, that hasn't been the case with all my classes, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, it, it always helped me when I was a student, too, when the class was organized well. So, you know, just passing, passing it forward. Okay. Um, so modal analysis and, and harmonic response. And so hopefully this is, this is a concept that you've, you, you're at least familiar with. And so you've, you've at least kind of heard... You've heard about this, maybe not exactly in these terms, but you are aware, okay? Um, and so whenever you're doing any kind of structural design, you know, part of it is, is, you know, kind of what we've done up to this point is to make sure that, you know, just from a loads and constraints perspective, you know, your, your structure can withstand those loads, right? So that's, that's kind of what we were focusing on a lot in this class. Okay? Um, but another structural consideration um, that you have to have is this idea of vibrations and resonance.
Because in reality, you know, there's there's more than one way that your structure can break. You know, much to the uh, dismay of, of structural engineers, right? And so it's not it's not just one thing you have to worry about. It's usually a dozen of things that you have to worry about. Sometimes more than a dozen. Uh, but vibrations and resonances is, is one thing that's really important. Okay. And so what and so what do I mean by that? And so every every structure, or even broader than that, every object in general. As something known as a natural frequency. Okay. Structure's natural frequency is basically the one that it naturally likes to vibrate at. So this, so this idea of a natural frequency has, has a couple of implications, okay? So the first implication is that if you, uh, if you expose your structure to what I call like a, an impulsive loading, and so let's say you take a structure and you just, you kick it or something, right? So um, then what's gonna happen is that after you apply that impulsive loading, then the structure is gonna vibrate at that natural frequency. And so think about, uh, you know, if, if you've ever played a, a musical instrument before, or, you know, more, um, I guess, more uh, specifically guitar, right? When you pluck a guitar string, that's, that's basically the same thing as you're applying impulsive loading, because you're applying kind of a force for a very, very brief amount of time, okay? And, if you, and the idea with guitars and, and most musical instruments in general is that, you know, that when you apply that impulsive loading, then you know the vibration at which the string is going to vibrate at that produces a sound. Okay? And a lot of musical instruments are tuned in such a way that you know you get a very specific sound for those uh, for those guitar strings. Okay? We'll bring up guitar strings a bit uh, more later as well. Okay? So that's kind of the nice uh, kind of fun aspect of natural frequencies. But the one that's kind of more important for structural design is that if you apply loading. If you apply uh, some kind of uh, oscillating load that is at the same frequency as the natural frequency, then what you can get is resonance. And resonance in, in nine times out of 10 is a bad thing because what can happen with resonance is that this will basically amplify the vibrations that the structure will, is, will undergo. And ultimately those large amplitude vibrations are gonna cause your structure to fail or to break apart. Yes, question. Um, is uh, impulsive, the term for impulsive loading, does it mean scalar? Um, 
when I say impulsive loading, it just means you apply the load for a very brief amount of time. So the direction and the and the magnitude don't really matter all too much. It's it's just more that you just apply very very. So kind of the the physical um, implementation that I usually um, think of is you know you just kick you kick something right. If I take this table and I just like kick it, right? You can see that the table is like vibrating after I, I kick it, right? So that's that's the whole idea with impulsive loading. Yeah. Uh, the reason I was asking is because you mentioned you did yeah the string. The thing that comes to mind is the piano strings. Mm -hmm. the piano strings are, are translated forces because the force translates from the key to the actual piano that strikes the right. But what, but what produces the sound in the piano is actually the when the hammer actually strikes the, the, the string on the inside. So that's that's the vibration that we're, that we're talking about. Yeah, the reason yeah. I was asking whether it was whether it was a scalar or a vector ah, is okay. that translation portion. Ah, uh, okay, I see. I see. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Normally, normally the force is applied um, you know, kind of perpendicular to the, the structure. That usually produces the most vibration. Yeah. Um, Dr. Chan. Yes. Um, just for clarity, um, the stiffness of a structure uh, has a frequency, and at a certain frequency, it can fail. Yes, and that's and that's the resonance. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I guess having said that, um, that means that there's frequencies that the structure can withstand above the the resonance frequency. Is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can go above, you can go both above and below the resonant frequency. Yeah, just not that certain area, not that certain number. Exactly, exactly. That's yeah. very interesting. Thank you, sir. Yep. Yeah, so the, so kind of the, the example that I use for resonance is, is think about, um, think about if you're on the playground and you're sitting on a swing, right? And so naturally, you know, if the thing that you want to do on a swing is you want to swing higher and higher, right? And so the way that you usually do this is that, you know, the best way is if you have a friend that kind of pushes you, you know, on the swing, right? Uh, but if you don't have any friends, you know, one way that you can kind of get yourself to go higher and higher is if you kind of kick your legs up and bring your legs back, right? And, you know, kind of the natural thing that, you know, a lot of kids understand is that you you kind of do this in a particular rhythm, right? And so if you kind of kick your, you, you basically kick your legs up when you're kind of, you know, at the bottom and then you bring your legs back like this, right? You very quickly learn that there's a very natural rhythm that will get you higher and higher and higher. So that's resonance in action. And so that 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 whole system of you sitting on the swing has a particular natural frequency. And by you kicking your legs out and bringing them back in, a, in that particular frequency, that's going to result in higher and higher and higher, um, you know, amplitude oscillations. Or even better, if your friend is kind of pushing you at that exact frequency as, as well. Okay. And so when you have, when you're sitting on a swing, you know, resonance is fun. Uh, when you're designing a building, a commercial building, resonance is not fun. So you want to avoid resonance because you know you don't want your uh, you don't want your twenty story building to be swaying in the wind like like crazy. Okay. okay. Um, any questions on on this? All right. <clears throat> and so you know another example of, of resonance um, that you know a lot of people actually apply this to the final project, and so that's why I kind of want to mention it is making your building earthquake proof okay so that's that's kind of a it's kind of a term that gets thrown around a lot in california and it, it means it means a lot of different things it, it has to do more with more than just uh, resonant frequencies uh but one way that you can make a building resonant proof or earthquake proof i should say is to make sure that its natural frequencies are different than earthquake frequencies
because earthquakes, I think, are, are a very kind of naturally occurring kind of oscillating load, right? And so when an earthquake occurs, you know, it, it kind of shakes the ground with a particular frequency, right? Um, and so in order to make sure your buildings are earthquake proof, you want to make sure that the frequencies or the typical frequencies that earthquakes um, occur at are different than the natural frequencies of your building. Because if that, if, if that weren't true, and so if your building would, would uh, you get resonance along with an earthquake, then that is a very quick and very kind of uh, catastrophic way for your building to fail. Fun fact, so the, the building that we're in right now, the CS building, we're earthquake proof, so we have nothing to worry about. But the engineering building on the other side, ironically, is not earthquake proof. And so, you know, it's uh, uh, kind of a funny thing that the building that the civil engineers actually sit in, the mechanical engineers typically, they sit in, that was not earthquake proof, but the, the CS building is um, kind of a funny thing. Um, not so funny when I'm when I found out I'm moving offices to the engineering building next year, but you know, I'd like to stay. I'd like to stay here if I could. But uh, yeah, the, that sounds like a very um, haunting fact. Uh, <laughs> makes me yeah. not want to be in those buildings at all. I know I, I resisted it for years, but uh, um, I said you're a mechanical engineering faculty, so you can't uh, you can't hang out with the CS people for your entire time here. So, okay. That's true. Oh my goodness. Was there an earthquake? No. It just got stuck, stuck there. Okay. Here. So my office is gonna be on the second floor. So I'm gonna avoid the elevator. I think the elevators are there yeah. and cursed. I hate the though. Yeah. Agreeing <laughs> with uh old civil engineering building codes, but like you say that's not earthquake proof. Is that like normal or OP? So these buildings are really old. And so, uh, uh, so building codes have been updated in the years since this building was made. And uh, CSU, we have problems with funding. And so uh, I, I can I can for, for hours, but but basically we don't have the money to make it, to make it earthquake proof. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Okay. Anyway, we should get back on track. Okay, and so to kind of illustrate this a bit more, uh, you know, I do want to kind of bring up a much more simple example, um, just so that we can kind of get a sense of, you know, what characteristics and structures, um, you know, um, contribute to the natural frequencies. Okay, so let's talk about strings because strings are kind of a very nice, um, very nice example. And so, you know, um, I mentioned that every structure, every object has a natural frequency, but of course, you know, these, these natural frequencies are not just chosen at random, okay? They depend on a lot of properties or a lot of uh, characteristics of the object at hand, okay? And so to illustrate this, so let's, let's look at a string uh, because we can actually come up with an equation for the natural frequency of a string. All right, so let's let's draw it out first. And so on one side, we're going to have a wall that the string is going to attach to. And so basically, the string is going to be fixed on the left side. Okay. Here is our string. Okay. So the string has a length. And so the length of the screen, string is going to be L. Okay. And what we're going to assume is that the string is going to be pulled tight. Okay. And so there's going to be a force, a tensile force, applied on the right-hand side. Okay. One other thing that we know about the string is that we know its material. And so one thing that we can uh, say is that it has a density of mu. Um, but we're going to define the density in kind of a strange way. So normally, density is a mass per unit volume. Uh, but because you know this is essentially just a one-dimensional case, this is going to define the mass per length of the string. Okay. So it's the same idea as density. So it's it's kind of an expression of you know how much mass the string has. It's just that you know we adjusted it based on the dimensions of the product. Okay. 
Okay. And so under these considerations, or under these conditions, we can come up with a natural frequency for the string. Okay. And so I'll go ahead and give that the symbol Fn. I'm not going to derive this equation, but you can, but it's something you can kind of look up um, fairly easily on, on Wikipedia. So the natural frequency of, of a string and tension is given by one half um, divided by L. So the, the length of the string is, is uh, given in the denominator. Then what you do is you take the square root and you take the square root of the tension T divided by the density mu. Okay. So this right here is the natural frequency of the string. So this is what it is in a simple 1D case. So I'm, I'm bringing this equation up, um, not because we can use it, because in reality, you know, most, most other objects are not as simple. And so it's not as easy to get a, a, a formula like this for the natural frequency. It's up just so that we can kind of talk about what are the different characteristics of the string, how that affects the natural frequencies, and then how we can kind of extrapolate from this to kind of more complex cases. So let's look at how each of these parameters affect the natural frequency, okay? and then we're going to extrapolate them. Through. Okay, so first, the first parameter that we're going to look at is the geometry of the string. And for a one-dimensional object like this, there's really only one geometric parameter, which is the length. All right, so geometry is, is, is one of the most important factors that, um, that affect the natural frequency. In fact, you know, you could argue that it's one of the most important factors. If you, if you look at the three parameters here, the length, the tension, and the, uh, and the density, you know, the length is the only one that's not underneath the square root. And so it's going to have a much stronger effect on the natural frequency than the other two parameters. Okay? Uh, and so if we kind of extrapolate this, you know, a three-dimensional object's geometrical features um, you know, and you can just go as, as simply just kind of the overall size or the volume of this of the structure, but also kind of its uh, its its smaller dimensions as well. All of those have a strong effect on the natural frequency of, of an object. Okay. <clears throat> so I would say, you know, that's that's definitely one of the stronger points. Okay. And what you'll see on Wednesday is that when we actually do a, a modal analysis, where you know, modal analysis basically answers the way of finding out the natural frequencies, you'll be surprised at how little you actually have to input. So the main thing you have to input is just the geometry. Uh, you have to apply one fixed support somewhere, uh, but that's it. And so after you do that, and you can you have to do a mesh, but the mesh can also be very coarse, right? But the main thing is to obtain the geometry for your for your structure, and then from that you can kind of glean a lot of other information about you know what the natural frequency is going to be. Okay, number two. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, number two, I'm going to bring up the, the density. Okay. And so the density is not the only uh, property of a, of a material that can affect the natural frequency. Uh, we can say that all the material properties, so things like the uh, Young's modulus, things like the bulk modulus, the density, all of these also have an effect on the natural frequency. Uh, so for most kind of simple linear cases, you know, we of course have the Young's modulus, shear modulus, uh, Poisson's ratio is part of this as well. You know, basically everything that we've kind of put into a very basic material data sheet, all those have an effect on the natural frequency, although not as strong as geometry. So geometry is still going to be the most, um, um, the biggest, kind of the biggest contributor to the frequency. Okay. <coughs> okay. And so, of course, that leaves our last parameter here, which is the tension. Okay. The tension is an interesting one because it's uh, it's 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 basically something external that we're applying to the structure, right? And so, it's not really something that's natural to the to the structure. So, it's not its geometry, it's not its material properties, but you can almost think of it as like as like a load that's being applied. Okay. And so, I like to group all these together into a term that I call pre-stress. And so what the pre-stress does is that you can almost think of it as almost like an extension of the material properties. So when you have kind of additional stress within a structure, it kind of increases the stiffness uh, of the structure itself which is also going to change or affect the natural frequency. So we'll see this on Wednesday. And so we'll do it we'll, we're, on Wednesday. We're going to do a test where we test for the natural frequencies without any loading. Okay? And you're going to get specific answers. And then after that, we're going to do a test when you do apply some loads. And then what you're going to see is that the natural frequencies are going to change. Okay. And so there is, there is an effect um, based on the pre-stress as, as well. Okay. Okay, so those I, I'd say those are kind of the three main categories of, of things that are going to affect your natural frequency, at least at least in terms of what's relevant for uh, for us at FDA. Okay. Any questions on on this? Yeah. So for a structure, the load stuff it will change. It's like, for example, if I'm thinking of like a bridge that mm -hmm. failed. Yeah. So the loads on that bridge it didn't change. It's just like the wind made. Um, hmm. frequency match with the natural frequency bridge. Right. So you're thinking of like the, the Tacoma Narrows bridge, yeah. the one that was kind of like doing yeah. this crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, so so I, it's, it's kind of funny. So so that so Tacoma Narrows is kind of the poster child for like resonance and kind of what can happen. Um, but if you if you really if you really, really want to be technical, it was it's actually uh, something something a little bit different than resonance, but it, it kind of looks like resonance. But Basically, what's what's happening with the Tacoma Narrows is that the wind was kind of blowing at it in a certain way, and it was kind of exciting the bridge along with its natural frequency, which is kind of cause it to do that. Um, my understanding was that this occurred when the bridge um, didn't have any loading on it, so it's not it didn't have any cars on it, it didn't have that many people. Um, most of the videos that you see of Tacoma, Tacoma Narrows that nobody's on the bridge, right? Um, 
not to say that it, you know, if it was loaded, if you did put cars on the bridge, like a bunch of cars, that it would have stabilized it. I don't think that's the case, but it would have it would have helped maybe a little bit, like shift that natural frequency in a way where it's not exactly the same as as the wind. Um, okay, so for any structure, the loads doesn't change. It's the natural frequency. Is... Oh, I see what you're saying. So 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 there there's a couple natural frequencies. So when you have when you have no loads at all, like the natural frequency is going to be a certain number. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you apply the loads, what you're going to see is that natural frequency is going to shift up or it's going to shift down depending on how the loads are being applied. So applying the loads are basically going to shift the natural frequency kind of up, up or down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this formula. So, you know, if we increase the tension in the string, so if we increase T's, we double it, the natural frequency is going to be different than it was before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Chan. Yes. Thank you for saying all that because um, I wanted to uh, ask about the, the famous Tacoma Narrow Bridge, um, but I didn't want to waste any class time. So, but my question is for that case, that case, it's not resonance, it's what you're saying. Technically, it's something else. I could yeah. ask that myself. I, I, I still can, personally, I still consider it resonance. Um, but if you if you ask certain people, they'll they'll say it's actually aerodynamic flutter. That, yeah, yeah, talking. I've heard that before. Yeah, um, sounds yeah, good, sir. Yeah, if if you really want to get into it, uh, yeah, there's 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 tons of papers on it. But um, but I I still consider it resonance just because I teach I teach a lot of classes that talk about resonance, and it's really useful to have. A, it's a very like famous case. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it, the videos are fun to watch too. So if you've never if you've never seen videos on Tacoma Narrows, I would definitely look it up. It's like, I'm sure there. everyone here has. It's very famous. It's the most yeah. well-known case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so that's so those are kind of the main properties that affect the natural frequency. So when you're designing a structure um, and your natural frequencies are kind of in a problematic zone, you know, I bring this up so that, you know, if you if you need to shift the natural frequencies in one way or the other, um, based on your design specifications, you know, these are the main things that you can consider. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's about it for the natural frequency. So let's talk about harmonic response. Okay. So let's talk, let's talk a bit about harmonic modes. Okay. And so the natural frequency is is uh, basically the mat the natural frequency tells you you know which which frequencies are going to cause resonance in your structure. Okay. The next question to ask is you know if you do have resonance in your structure, you know what's going to happen? What is what is your structure going to look like under resonance? And so that's that's what the harmonic modes are going to to tell us. Right. So this is so this is often very interesting to see because the uh, the harmonic mode is going to kind of basically tell you or at least gives you a, a preview in terms of how your structure would fail if you had resonance. OK. OK. And so let's see what these actually look like in, in the string. OK. And so the, the important thing I, I want to illustrate with harmonic modes and this this kind of extends. This is mostly this is mostly kind of an ANSYS thing is that we're going to view harmonic modes in ANSYS as well. And the way ANTIS is going to show you the harmonic modes is as if it were like a deformation field. Okay. But the important thing to highlight is that when you're looking at harmonic modes, you're really just looking at the shape of the deformation.
So what I mean by that is that, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you're going to view these harmonic modes in ANSYS, you know, ANSYS is going to show it in a way where it's going to say, you know, you're viewing the first harmonic mode and the deformation is this, okay? Um, those deformation values don't have any meaning. And so, you know, it's, don't, don't take too seriously kind of the magnitudes of the, of the oscillations or the magnitudes of the deformations. You're only looking at the shape. So let me show you what I mean. And so let's let's uh, let's show what the first harmonic mode is going to look like in a string. And so, you know, we have our string, our string is intention, and we know what the natural frequency is. Okay? If we were to excite this string at that natural frequency, uh, or even if we just applied an impulsive loading, okay, the deformation shape that you would see would look something like this. So actually, actually, let me do this. So let me, let me draw the original geometry as well, okay? Just kind of make it a bit more clear. So the dotted line here, I'm, I'm going to have this original original geometry. And then the loop or the kind of the, the bending one, that's the that's the harmonic mode. Okay. And so if you were to excite the if you were to excite the string at its natural frequency, the string's deformation would look like this, except you know, except it wouldn't it wouldn't be hovering in place right there. It would kind of Kind of go back and forth, you know, between these extremes. So you'd have kind of one prominent peak, and then that peak would kind of just, it, it almost look like it's it's it almost look like a standing if you if you've heard that term before. Okay, and so it'll look like this the the string is kind of just hovering in that mode, but it's going to go up and down. Okay. <coughs> okay. So we're going to view this in ANSYS as well. And so we're going to view the different harmonic modes and what they look like, OK? The interesting thing that I think a lot of people don't really realize is that you know, there's more than one natural frequency for a given structure. So the one that's usually computed, so you know, for you know, for the string, we had our formula above. You know, that's usually the lowest uh, natural frequency. Okay, so the fun. Some people even call it the fundamental. Frequency. But you can cause resonance uh, with more frequencies than just the just the lowest one. The only thing that's going to be different is that if you excite if you excite your structure at a frequency that's different than the fundamental frequency, you're going to get different shaped deformations. So the term that I, I like to use for these different um, deformation shapes is called mode shapes, okay? All right, and so the one that I've shown you so far is the first harmonic mode. So let's look at the second harmonic mode. Okay. 
So the second harmonic mode in a string would look like this. So we're gonna have two peaks. Okay. Here. Okay. And so for a string, you know, in order to obtain the second harmonic mode, you would have to excite it at a frequency that's twice as much as the fundamental frequency. Okay, so F2 here is equal to two Fn, or Fn is our you know, natural frequency that we talked about before. One more. So I'll show you what the third harmonic mode looks like, just for kind of illustration purposes. So for the third harmonic mode, uh, we have three humps there. Okay? And the formula for the third harmonic mode is just three times the natural frequency, the fundamental frequency. So for a string, you know, finding these higher order modes or finding these higher harmonic modes is pretty easy. And so you just you just take the fundamental frequency and just multiply it by scalar values, so or integer values, I should say. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, for real structures, you know, that are in two dimensions, three dimensions, it's a lot more complex. And so you can't just multiply the fundamental frequency by a number. Okay. You're going to have different um, harmonic frequencies. Okay. <clears throat> Main reason is that, you know, for, for these more complex structures, you can have different resonant frequencies in different directions on the structure. So we'll see this in our in our activity Wednesday. And so you know the, what ANSYS is going to give you, it's going to give you well you can you can specify, but you know you can look at the first ten, for instance, the first ten resonant frequencies, and you'll see that they're not just integer multiples of each other. Okay. And so for example, you know let's say that we have kind of a triangular block. So for a triangular block like this, you know, if you if you vibrate the block in this direction, okay, versus this direction, right, those are going to give you different resonant frequencies. It was a lot more complex in multiple dimensions. And so, you know, it becomes a lot more difficult to, um, you know, to even estimate what the, what the natural frequencies are, okay? But this is where FEA comes in. And so, you know, when you have complicated geometries like this, you still want to know what the natural frequencies are and you still want to know what the mode shapes look like, okay? Um, 
But you know, you can use finite elements to answer these questions so that you can uh, use them as part of your design. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Yeah, question. In terms of like the vibrating structure, in terms of like earthquake proof or not earthquake. Yeah. Because uh, in terms of earthquakes, like or seismic waves per se, there mm -hmm. are different types of waves that affect different areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so for example, a higher building waves with bigger amplitudes will affect a longer or a taller building as opposed to a smaller building. Yep. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, a smaller wave or a wave that has a, a high, higher frequency mm -hmm. has more oscillation would affect a smaller building rather than not sky rise. How yep. do you integrate that in terms of calculating the natural frequencies? Yeah. Of the building? Yeah. No, it's 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 a good question. And so you know when you when you're designing a building for earthquake proof, you know you always want to make it resistant to uh, a range of frequencies, and so it's not just it's not just kind of one one frequency that you're kind of aiming at because earthquakes occur at, at very many different frequencies, and so you're always aiming for a range, and you're also aiming for like a factor of safety as well. And so you know not only you're going to be outside this particular range, but you want to be like way outside it as well, so that you're kind of prepared for all different kinds of earthquakes that that can occur. Um, some buildings are are just kind of impossible to kind of uh, design kind of around those kinds of earthquakes, especially like the really, really tall kind of skyscraper type buildings. Like those are notoriously very difficult to make earthquake. Um, but but an interesting thing that you that you see in a lot of these buildings that you see it's called a counterweight, basically. And so they've they've introduced additional weight within the building itself, and they've designed it in a way where it can kind of free swing as well to kind of offload some of that that um, that stuff. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so in, in 2019, I actually went on vacation to, to Taiwan, actually. And in, uh, they have a really tall building in Taipei 101. And they actually made it part of this, like you can go up to the top and you can see this gigantic mass damper in there. Uh, and it's, it's amazing, like it's, it's, it's really, it used to be the tallest, but you know, now it's, now it's, no, it's, it's still very impressive, but not, not as tall as you know, some of the other buildings in the world. To see that mass damper, and I've seen videos of it kind of in action where like there's an earthquake happening and you see the mass damper kind of swaying is, yeah, it's really cool. So yeah, there's there's not a simple answer to that question because there's there's a lot of different ways to to kind of make a building earthquake proof, but but generally you want to look, you're aiming for a range with a factor of safety. And if you can't get that factor of safety, then you have to do something, some some more clever thing to design, like, like a mass damper. Yeah. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. All right. So let's talk about kind of the tools that we have available in ANSYS. So there, there are two main tools that we're going to be looking at. Um, so one is modal analysis. So that's where we're going to spend most of our time. And the other one is uh, harmonic response. So let's talk about modal analysis. First. So modal analysis is, is actually a very simple analysis within, within ANSYS. And so the idea with modal analysis is that you have a geometry, you have a basic understanding of how it's going to be constrained, uh, and maybe it's loads as well. And you want to answer the question, you know, what are the resonant frequencies of my structure? And so actually, you know, compared to all the other analyses that we've done, uh, modal analysis is probably the simplest. And so basically the, the only main output from a modal analysis is just a list of frequencies.
The only thing that you have to do for a modal analysis is to, first of all, make sure you have a geometry. So make sure you have a CAD file that you can uh, put it in the ANSYS. Um, and so besides that, the only thing is you have to mesh it and you have to make sure that there's enough supports to prevent rigid body motion. So you don't even need loads, right? And so you can put loads. Uh, and so what the loads are going to do is that it's going to change the, the state of stress or the state of pre-stress in the structure. Uh, but if you want to get kind of like an unloaded natural frequencies, then you can do that. Yeah, you just have to make sure there's a fixed support somewhere somewhere in the, in the, in the simulation. OK, that yeah. makes sense. OK, thank you. Yeah. So if you, push, if you push on it, then it, it's not going to roll. So one convenient way to set up modal analysis um, that really requires very little work is to start with a static structural, because most of the time, you know, if, you, if you're designing a structure from scratch, you know, you're going to be doing static structural anyway. What you can do is you can link the modal analysis from the static structure, and then it's going to take the same mesh and the same boundary conditions. And then, you know, you don't, you don't, basically you don't have to do everything twice. from the main menu like it is oh. yeah yeah so it's uh instead of static structural there's you'll, you'll see there's another tool called modal analysis you can drag that yeah and we'll do we'll do this on uh we'll do this on wednesday so you okay so another another nice thing that you can do in modal analysis is that once you compute the resonant frequencies, you can view you can view the shape of the harmonic modes. And so remember what the harmonic modes tell you is that if you if you were to vibrate the structure at those frequencies, then you can see exactly what the what the deformation is going to look like. And, and you know, same thing applies here that I told you before. So you know, when ANSYS shows you the shapes of these harmonic modes, it's gonna it's gonna show you basically as if it were a deformation plot. And so it's gonna have magnitudes on them. And so it's gonna have you know 0 0.5, 0 0.6, something like that. But those aren't actual, those are not actual deformations. And so those values there are only meant to illustrate the shape. So for example, you know, if we take our string, right, and let's say that we asked ANSYS to show us the first harmonic mode of our string. Okay. And so it's going to give you a plot like this, and the way ANSYS is going to display it to you, and, and I still don't know why it, it does this, because it, it's, it's more confusing than anything. It's going to tell you that this deformation here is going to be something like, I don't know, like 0 0.75, 
And for some reason, it gives you units. And so it'll, it'll say 0 0.75 millimeters, okay? But that, but that 0 0.75 is, is meaningless. And so it, that doesn't mean that if you occur, if you trigger resonance, you're gonna get a deformation of 0 0.75 millimeters. Okay? So this means. Because the actual magnitude, so when you do have resonance occur in your structure, you know, you are gonna get large amplitude um, deformations but the actual amplitude of those deformations depends on how strong your forcing is. And so there's a difference. And so there's a difference between, you know, if you take a structure and you kind of just lightly just kind of vibrate with your hands versus you take the same structure and you kind of like jolt it, you know, like, like this, right? So one is going to produce more deformation than the other, okay? Um, and in, in modal analysis, remember in modal analysis, you know, we haven't applied any kind of load yet, okay? Um, you can apply static loads. And so, you know, we'll see what, what, what occurs when we have static loads. But static loads are not the same as oscillating loads, okay? And so the important thing to remember is that when you have resonance, you know, you have to have some kind of oscillating load, okay? So the load itself has to also um, change according to whatever the frequency is. Dr. Chan. Yes. If that is 0 0.75 uh, is not um, a deformation, um, what is it? it? It's a magnitude? It's, it's, you can almost think of it as kind of like dummy numbers that ANSYS uses just to illustrate. Okay. And so, you know, while the peak is going to be 0 0.75, you know, the reason ANSYS does that is to tell you that that part of the structure is going to be deforming more than say this oh, part, okay. like, part will be like 0 0.4. Or something it's just like giving you an idea of where the maximum deformation is going to occur due to the natural frequencies. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's meant to just be kind of a relative thing. And so it's I saying see. that this the middle here would would deform relatively more than the other parts of the structure. So, I see. You know, that's that's the reason why there are numbers, but. I don't know why, you know, when you when we actually see, maybe they've updated it. Maybe maybe they've made it better because it's a big complaint. I, I think a lot of people have, but uh, you'll see that when we actually go to do it, you the deformations actually have units. Um, do those so, values ever reach one? Um, yeah. So actually, so the one the the one might actually be the part where the deformation is the highest. Yeah, um, I was thinking maybe the software is um, associating the minimum areas of deformation with a low <coughs> decimal number and maximum deformation with one. So from zero to one, and with one being maximum deformation, but uh, I'm not as familiar as you are, obviously. Yeah, so 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 you would think that that would be make the most sense too, but not. it's not gonna be like that every single time. Yeah, I so see. the numbers, I, I, I agree that the numbers have to be there, but I, I don't agree with kind of how they display it with the units and, and everything. I see. Um, Sounds yeah, good, sir. You'll, yeah, you'll you'll see on Wednesday. I, I say that a lot now because you know that's that's kind of the biggest misconception I think people have with modal analysis is kind of interpret taking these numbers like a little bit too serious. Yeah. Okay. So the interesting thing that you can do, um, and so you know, the modal analysis you'll see you'll see is, is very simple to set up. So there's there's really not that much to it, but you can do a, a lot with it. Right? So not only not only having knowledge of the natural frequencies is important, but you can actually use the mode shapes to kind of give you some hints in terms of, you know, where your structure <coughs> or how your structure can be improved.
And so generally speaking, uh, when, you, when you're looking at the low, um, the, the resonant frequencies on the lower end, and you look at the, at the mode shapes, um, the, the direction of the mode shapes associated with the lower resonant frequencies show which direction your structure is weakened. For example, so let's say we have a very kind of simple uh, table. And so let's say that we have this table, we ran it through ANSYS, okay? And what we found is that the lowest, uh, the lowest resonant frequency had a mode where the table was kind of swinging in this direction. So from our perspective, it's going to sway from, from left to right. Okay. And so that means that our, um, our structure can be strengthened in that direction. Okay. And so kind of an alternative design that you, can, uh, that you can come up with is maybe one we introduce crossbars to increase the stiffness in that direction. So maybe in our improved design, you know, maybe we introduce a crossbar like this okay, okay, to basically add rigidity in that direction, and that's going to improve just the overall stiffness of our, of our structure. Okay? So, this kind of, so this is kind of a clever kind of way uh, to kind of give you kind of a quick idea in terms of you know, which ways that you can, you can improve your structure in terms of, in terms of that. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so we're gonna spend most of our time on, on Wednesday in, in modal analysis, because even though it's, it's, it's very simple, there's a lot of really useful and cool information from that. Okay. Um, but the follow-up to this is um, something called harmonic response analysis. And so at this point, you know, after we perform modal analysis, we, we know what the natural frequencies are, okay? Um, but, you know, kind of alongside our discussion of the modal shapes, you know, some, maybe we want to actually see, you know, if an earthquake were to occur, or, you know, if, if some kind of uh, oscillating loading were to occur, you know, we want to know exact, exactly, you know, what's the magnitude of the deformations or the magnitudes of the vibrations that we can expect to see.
but not just the shape. So now we're actually interested in seeing you know, how much how much is our part going to going to sway. Okay. All right. So this is so this is the purpose of, of harmonic response analysis. And so the big difference, the big difference between harmonic response analysis and modal analysis is that we actually are going to apply an oscillating mode. Okay. So of course that oscillating mode, you're gonna to have to give it a few things. And so you're gonna to have to give it a magnitude. Um, as well as a direction. Okay. Maybe just a just a magnitude. Yeah. Oh, wait, just by the location. Notice how we're not giving it a frequency, right? Which you would think would be kind of a, an important property for something like this. Okay? But what harmonic response analysis is gonna do is that it's gonna test the structure uh, for this mode over a range of frequencies. It's going to test a range of frequencies. It's going to tell you, you know, for each frequency that it tests, what the magnitude of the of the resonance is going to be. All right, so the result of this is not is something known as a spectrum plot. Basically looks something like this. So a typical kind of 2D plot. Okay. On the horizontal axis, we're gonna have frequency. And on the vertical axis, we're going to have deformation. Or deformation magnitude, I should say. Okay. All right. And so in reality, you know, it, it's it's the plot here is going to be more um, messy than this. Um, but I'm going to show you kind of a clean version just to kind of show you, kind of illustrate kind of the most important features. Okay. It might look something like this. Um, Dr. Tron, I might have missed this, but we're, we're going to be going over this plot on Wednesday, correct? Yes, 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 we are. Okay. I've never seen this plot, or I don't think I have. Yeah, it's uh, this plot. I guess, I guess, I guess it, it's it's shown in a vibrations class, thing, but it's it's but but probably but where I saw most of these plots were actually in because uh, I took some classes in signal processing when I when I was in in college, and so this was kind of more. Uh, in that in that kind of wheelhouse, but when you talk when you talk about resonance and vibrations, you know a spectrum plot is is something that's uh, really key. Because, right? um, cool. like I mentioned, you know, ANSYS is going to vibrate your structure at different frequencies, 
and it's going to tell you what the magnitude of the response is going to be. Okay. What you're going to see in the spectrum plot is that there are going to be a couple peaks. Right. Um, and so these peaks, and so there will be times when the spectrum plot will spike up, and then it's going to go down, and it's going to spike up, and then it's going to go down. Okay. These peaks are going to correspond to the resonant frequencies or the natural frequencies of the structure. Very nice. So harmonic response is useful because, you know, let's say that you're designing a building, right? And you actually want to see, you know, if an earthquake were to actually hit my building and this earthquake were occurring over a certain range of frequencies, you know, you want to be able to see how much deformation can occur, right? And you can do this not only for deformation, but you can do this for stress, you can do it for strain, uh, basically for any output um, as well, okay? And so you can kind of very easily see with, with actual numbers this time, you know, what the response is going to be and whether you're, you're uh, your structure is going to fail. Okay. The only thing that you have to know is you have to know kind of the range of frequencies that you're looking at. Okay. Um, and so if you're working with earthquake, for instance, you know, you would plug in a typical range of frequencies for an earthquake. Um, and you'd have to know kind of the, the magnitude. And so, um, you know, going back to the example of earthquakes. And so if you know that the earthquake is going to move your structure by a certain amount, right. And so you can, you can kind of quantify the amount of shaking that the earthquake is going to do. Uh, then you can put that as an input here, right. Then you can actually test and see, you know, what the, um, you know, how much deformation and how much resonance you can, uh, you can get. Okay. So a fun project. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think the school would let you have this, but if you, if you can get a CAD model for the engineering building and you can do like a harmonic response analysis for that, you can see exactly how screwed we would be if a big earthquake were to actually hit this, uh, this campus. But I don't think the school would. Uh, let you let, let you have a CAD model for this because uh, yeah that's that's normally things they like to sweep under the rug <laughs> until the building collapses and then they'll and then they'll and then they'll uh, blame they'll blame everyone but themselves. <laughs> Any final questions on on this? Okay, all right. So that's all we got. That's all I got for today. And so Wednesday we'll we'll see all of this in action. So Wednesday we're gonna do an activity. Um. um oh, question. Yeah, so um, about that activity you were about to get to, um, when is that going to be available? Uh, on uh, tomorrow. Wednesday? Tomorrow? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to proofread it one more time tomorrow. Yeah, please do. I, I encourage you to proofread as many times as, as, as you want, just so there's no errors for us to run into. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'll proofread it. I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll try to see. I'll try to catch any, any typos that there, there might be. But uh, yeah, it should. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right. So thanks, everybody. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening, and I will see you all on, on Wednesday. Hey, Professor, I have a quick question. Sure. What's up? So um, I'm doing the final, and for one of the additional features, uh, convergence test would be okay, right? Uh, no, convergence test is, is separate. So when I talk about extra features, I'm talking about uh -huh. you know either activities five, six, seven, or eight. And so you should incorporate two of those activities Two of our basically, you know, for all the second half activities that we're doing, you should incorporate oh. two of those activities into the final project. Like, like optimization type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. so far we've, we've we've done two of them so far. So we've done um, transient analysis, and so that was the unsteady stuff, and then we've done optimization, and then this week we're doing uh, modal analysis, and next week we're doing buckling. And so you can do either, you know, maybe optimization and modal analysis, or maybe do transient analysis and buckling. You know, should, you should incorporate two out of those four. Okay, and um, if incorporated, do I have to do them both on the first scenario and second scenario, or can I just pick one that I favor and do it there? So, so your boundary conditions are going to be are going to be different uh, for all of these because because the features are all kind of unique, and so um, those the the different features are kind of their own thing. And so you'll probably come up with different boundary conditions for each one. Oh, uh, okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so let's say I wanted to run um, like the optimization one, right? Yeah, I can uh, I can select from scenario one or two those oh, four yes, yes. 
Yeah, yeah, you can you can you can reuse one of your static scenarios for like optimization or something. Right? And I guess you can do that for for this as well for modal analysis. Yeah, and um, regarding that, do I have to do both of them or can I pick one that I favor? You can just pick one. Okay, thank you. Yep. I mean, you had a question. Yeah, in terms of uh, optimization, does it have to be the same type of optimization? No, it, it can be. You can optimize over anything, and so as long as it's an, as long as it's something. As long as it supports kind of your original original objective or niche, an, a, original question that you setting to accomplish in the finite element report, um, you can the optimization can be on anything. Yeah. I figured out how to do the capital optimization that I asked you about the other day. Oh, nice, nice. Overall, thing. nice, nice, nice. Nice. Yeah, definitely, definitely go for it. Yeah. Optimization is is very cool. <laughs> I think it's the coolest one out of the out of the second half that we're doing. Yeah. But it also takes the moments. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Keith, Marcos, any any final questions? Is this Keith now? Sorry, I had all tapped. I'm good. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. I'll see you. Uh, see you Wednesday. See you Wednesday.